Good morning, good to have you in our service here this morning, and those of you who are watching on uh, with the CDs, it's a privilege to have you aboard. So, this morning, speaking about here, the gospel, and what it is, what it is not, and we're going to be on this morning here for probably the next three messages, and we're going to go to Romans chapter 10. So, if you want to turn there, you can, but we're going to give you, prior to that, you have, when you study scriptures, you have a text, and you have a context. You cannot take and make a text out of the context and separate the two. You have to keep them together if you want the right interpretation. This is going to cover something that Baptists have mutilated. Not all Baptists, but a lot of them have absolutely mutilated and actually been responsible for sending a lot of people to hell if they don't get up out of that seat and come forward as the pastor advises them that they should do if they want to be saved. Then sometimes they will say, well, you can be saved in your seat. We're going to start out and we're going to take Romans chapter 10 and you're going to learn what this uh, chapter teaches and it isn't coming forward in a church. It has absolutely nothing to do with coming forward in a church. And time after time after time, I've said in Baptist churches, when I've been out, I like to go to different churches and so forth. I've sat in Baptist churches and I've heard this same bunch of malarkey that's been put out as an invitation. We had a man come up that was working, uh, for example, came up, he was from uh, Tennessee, and he worked on his job as a supervisor on different jobs that he had, and he was in our area in Ohio. He came to our church after about three times coming, he said, Love the messages, but you don't give an invitation. And I said, we give an invitation after every service. And that invitation is right where you sit. Will you believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross and paid for your sins so you don't have to go to hell and do it yourself? And he said in John 19.30, it's finished. You're born from above. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said and answered and said unto Nicodemus, You must be born again. The word again is a Greek word, anothen, A-T-E-H-O-N, or E-N, and it means from above. So, if you're born from above, there's nothing you can earn, do below in order to be saved except believe what Christ came from above to the earth to do and said it's finished when he died upon the cross, and you believe it. That's it. We get in church, if you want to be saved, you slip out of your seat and come forward because if you confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus or Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And we use that as a condition to be saved. We're going to check the context and see if that has anything to do with the church, which it doesn't hasn't anything to do with walking forward in public, doesn't have a thing to do with that. So we're going to begin. And we're going to start with the fact that what does the Lord want us to do? Well, you don't have to turn here, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, and also chapter 3, verse 12, you'll find out there that we are told to use plainness of speech. We're not to add to anything to it, we're not to make up our own ideas about let Jesus come into your heart, which is not found in the Bible. And if you analyze that, for example, let Jesus come into your heart, which is the seat of your conscience, how do you know that he came in? And how do I let him do something when we're getting away from salvation again? Salvation in the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not asking Jesus to come in. And it's not Jesus that comes in unless you understand the Trinity. It is after that you've heard the word of truth and you believed you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's the Holy Spirit that comes in. And that's what God gives to every believer. Then we go on and we find out in, over here in Romans chapter 10, and let's turn there, if you will, and we're going right down through Romans chapter 10, the whole chapter. Now many of these have been brought out by Bible teachers and so forth, that when Paul wrote to the Romans, he was addressing with the emphasis upon in chapter 9, 
the Jewish nation in the past. Chapter 10, the Jewish nation in the present. Chapter 11, the Jewish nation in the future. We're going to take the present and we're going right down through and we're going to start with chapter 10, verse 1. So we're going to get the whole text and the context of this here. The whole text of this thing here is the fact, are you saved or are you lost concerning one nation, and that nation is the nation of Israel. It can apply to anyone who is not saved, but in this chapter, Paul addresses because he was a Jew and he killed many, many Christians. So he hated, he, he excelled in the Jewish religion above many of his peers. He was a starch religious man, and he was like the Muslims, if you don't believe my religion, then I'll kill you. This is what Paul, it was like what the Muslims do, and that's exactly what the Muslims do. That's their theory. Kill them if they don't worship Allah, and so forth. So, let's begin here in verse 10, chapter 1. Here we go. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Okay, first of all, his prayer is to God for his nation that he was born in the nation of Israel. He was a Jew. He was an Israelite. He was a Jew. And he followed their religious beliefs. So, Paul says, I met Jesus Christ and I came out of that. I know that I have a home in heaven all the way through and God used him to write 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. He was a starch hater of Christ. He became a starch faithful servant of Christ when he left the false religion and trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now, brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Then he goes on down and he tells what they have in verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That's like any church you have today. They have, and Baptist churches are doing this. I hate to attack the Baptist churches, but some of them are so far gone anymore that they've turned into two amusement centers, having the world music brought into their churches, the rock, anything that we can do to get young people, you don't bring the world into the church in order to win them to the Lord Jesus Christ. You may win some, but you teach them not how to serve Christ, not how to stand against Satan's music, and so forth. So, some may get saved, some may not. But you don't bring the world into the church. In order, these churches have been turned into amusement centers. Anything that we can do, we can change the music and so forth. We can get the rock in and so forth and get swinging and swaying and so forth and all of that kind of stuff. But the point is, the Lord wants a clean church. He wants that. And he says, they have a zeal of God. In other words, we've got all kinds of things going on. We'll have this, we'll have that, and we're going to have sales and all of this and one thing or another here, and, and whatever you can think of that will be entertainment centers for the church. Now, that doesn't condemn everything the church does to put on things that are good and healthy. But when you go to the point where you really overextend and do things, the point is, is the gospel in these churches given? Is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ given whenever there's a church service so people can be saved who come to visit your church? Many of these, no. We've entertained you, now you become a member of our church. Let's go on down. Paul said, I'm going to read it again. I bear them record. He did because he was part of it. He came, he, he was part of this uh, Jewish organization. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Oh, they got everything going on. We got the Feast of Tabernacles. We got the Feast of Passover. We got the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We got the Feast of Trumpets. We got the Feast of, on every feast, all these seven feasts, 
we got every kind of religious thing going on that makes you feel religious, just like Roman Catholicism has, just like Luther has, because he came out of it, he packed his suitcase with their doctrines, a couple of things he disagreed with, but he brought all the garbage out, and they practice it today. So, we have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. The reason we're going down through this, you've got to get the setting here, before we get to Romans 10, 9, and 10, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and so forth, believe in your heart that God's raging from the dead, thou shalt be saved. <laughs> you've got to understand, Paul's dealing with the Jews before we get down to Romans 10, 9, and 10. You're haters of Christ. And he's going to cover that as we go on down here just a little bit. Now, when he says you have a zeal of God not according to knowledge, you're ignorant of God's righteousness. How do we get God's righteousness? By trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's how we get God's righteousness. For in 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we have God's righteousness because he sent his own begotten son who was absolutely perfect righteous and when we put our trust in him he gives us his righteousness in exchange for taking our sin and eternally marking it paid so you'll never have to go to hell to pay for it very simple very very simple now let's go on down they were self-righteous because they prided themselves in how righteous they really were Hold your place there. Go with me back here in your Bible to Luke here. And let's go back here to chapter 16. Back to Luke in chapter 16. Okay, this is what Christ dealt with. Luke chapter 16. And let's begin to look here in verse 14 and 15. Luke chapter 16 and verse 14 and 15. He says this, And he said unto them, This is Christ. You are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. He didn't care how, <laughs> how righteous you consider yourself while you're over here. Let's go on over here to the 18th chapter. Let's go to the 18th chapter, begin in verse 9. 18 in verse 9, here we go. In verse 9 on down to 14. And he spake the parable on the certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, and so forth. And then if you read on down, you have the difference between the publican and the Pharisees. Pharisees were the Jews. They were your ones that supposedly taught the teachers. The scribes were the ones who would be your seminary teachers today. They were the ones that were, got into the Greek and the Hebrew and so forth like that and uh, taught the Pharisees were the ones that took it and they were stood in front of the people and taught them and so forth like that. So, he says, he spake this parable and the certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. These were your religious leaders. These were the ones. Now, we come on down and let's go on down here to verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, Ignorant? Willfully ignorant. Why? Because they were self-righteous. You can't hardly penetrate a person who in the community <clears throat> is well-liked, thought of highly as a respectable man or a woman, and knowing they pride themselves in that. They love it. They love people to admire them for what they appear to be. But way underneath, they're not as what appears on the surface. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, <laughs> I'm going to appear before you the self-righteous hypocrites. And I'm saying that's what Christ called them in Matthew chapter 23. You scribes and Pharisees, a big bunch of hypocrites. You travel land and see make one proselyte, when you do, you make two full child of the devil. So, establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law 
for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, the Jews and these teachers, and the teachers were, these were your leaders, your priests, your elders, your scribes, your Pharisees, and also the Sanhedrin, translated in the King James's council. You'd have to go to your Strong's Concordance and look it up to see if it's a, a council, or sometimes you can tell by the context if it is, but the word council was translated. It comes from Sanderon, which means Sanhedrin, and it, uh, you can look that up. Many times it is the Sanhedrin. They were made up mainly of the elders, but there were others in there too. There was 70 in the Sanhedrin, and one who was the high priest. So there are actually 71. These were your leaders. These were the ones of this cult religion of Judaism. They would not relinquish the fact of the law, because first of all, you can never be saved by the law. There is no one ever alive that's ever kept the Ten Commandments itself. No one. There were like 700 and some commandments that were given. In fact, it's very interesting when you do a study of the Old Testament coming up to chapter 19 and 20. Uh, therefore, after God liberated Israel outside of Egypt, he came there, led them through the wilderness and so forth, and then he took Moses upon Mount Sinai, and he said uh, to Moses, I'm now going to give you the commandments. You'll find all of these that are given in the book of Leviticus. If you look on the last chapter there, these are the commandments that were given, all of them in Leviticus. Deuteronomy is the second time of the giving of the law, and so forth. And you'll find, but the thing I want to point out is, clear back, and these Jews, these scribes should have known this. These were your professors. These were the ones that really dig into the Bible. And then the Pharisees, they, they taught the people and so forth like that and stood on what had been that they had been grounded in. So, clear back, and it's sort of interesting, clear back, you'll find out that in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 7 and 8, along with, you can jot this down and look, when God gave the commandments and the people said, John, Exodus chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 24, and verses 3 and 7. And here's what the people said when Moses came back down and gave these commandments unto the people. Their response was this. All the words which the Lord has said we will do. Hmm. But when you come to Exodus chapter 24 and verse 8, God gave the blood sacrifice because Moses sprinkled the blood upon the people. Because God knew, all that I say you're not going to do, I know humanity. So the first thing he did was he gave the blood that was a type of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that had to be spilled just as it was when he clothed Adam and Eve. He slew the animals, the blood had to be shed, which is a first mentioned principle, and it carries all the way through the Bible. Wherever you have a first mentioned principle, clear back in Genesis, you'll find it carries all the way through the Bible. Without the bleeding, shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So, the scribes and the Pharisees, they knew this. They knew it very much. It also, when John had written and concerning Nicodemus, who was also a Jew, we find out that he said you must be born from above. Again, is the Greek word anothen, A-N-T-H-O-N-E-N, anothen, which means from above. Nothing you can do down here will ever merit you eternal life. So, let's go on down to the next part of the verse, where he gets into it, Paul explains. In verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. When no one can ever keep the law perfectly. You can't even keep, no one's ever kept the Ten Commandments and all perfectly. And never broken one since you've been born and reached the age of accountability. Never a human being. James chapter 2 verse 10 says this, Whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offended just one point, you're as guilty as if you have broken them all, because there is no sin in heaven, and if you've committed one sin, you are ineligible to go to heaven. 
That's why it took Christ with no sin to come down to pay for you if you're so self-righteous you've only committed one sin that you can't make it. Because you're not going to heaven with that one sin not paid for, you see. So, let's go on down. Now, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. The man, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. That's all of them. So, if you're going to have righteousness by the law, you've got to obey 100% of the law. Don't ever forget James 2.10, Whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point. If you offended in one point of any kind, then every male had to go to Jerusalem three times a year. One man, Jewish man, was telling the man down in Lewisburg, Indiana, he said, uh, uh, you know, uh, he said, uh, and he was a Jewish man, in fact, I was witness to him, and uh, he had a clothing store down there, and uh, anyway, he said, uh, you know, good night. He said, I've never been there once. I don't have the money to go there. And uh, it was said to him, God didn't offer to pay your way. He just said, if you're a Jew, you will go to Jerusalem three times a year. Period. He didn't offer to pay your way. That's your problem. He didn't tell you to live in America. He didn't go to move to Jerusalem if you have a problem with it. But the impossibility of anybody being absolutely perfect on this earth since the time they have been born, since the time that they grow up till the time that they die, is an absolute impossibility. I'd hate to count the time we've all sinned, even before we've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, we tried to be good, but have we been good every time? No, no, no. That, that's, that's an impossibility. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So he's writing to the Jews now, Brother, my heart's desire to God for Israel that you might be saved. But I bear you record, you have a zeal of God. You're going through all these festivities. You look very religious, and you're impressing a lot of people. I see on this Washington Catholic program the other night. And we have on here, oh my goodness gracious, this was so holy. And we come out, and we have the things up here, and we carry the candles over here. And for heaven's sakes, we put this down, and we put that down. Everything is so precise and so neat and everything like that. And I thought, I'd just like to trip you the next time you take a step because that's how far you have fallen. You're going to fall right into hell when you die. You never said anything about Jesus Christ. You opened up a book that wasn't even the Bible. Well, i got to look at it. It came too close on the camera on that one. But I'm just saying, this is all a phony front. Paul is telling the Jews, I bear you record, you have a zeal of God. You're presenting to people how much you love God and how precious God is to you and all these precious ornaments that you have and you do this and be sure and lay it here. Fold the napkin exactly right now. You've rehearsed that and rehearsed that and all this garbage. But you never said a word about how to go to heaven. I watched it. I couldn't help but think that any intelligent people, how can you buy this garbage? I mean, how can you as a normal people that God has given you a mind if you never went to church? How can you believe these phony guys up there when if you even stop and think, tell me how to go to heaven when you die? Not one of you Catholic guys that walk up there with all your garments up there and things. That doesn't take me to heaven. And you don't tell me how to go to heaven? Don't think I'm lying to you. I watched the program. Not one word about Jesus Christ and going to heaven, how you have eternal life, not one. You are counterfeit from the word go. Period. Now, let's go on down. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. We come down to verse 4, Christ, the end of the law. Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. The man which doeth those things shall live by them, which is absolutely impossible because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There isn't a man alive that's ever lived by everything of the law. Figure 720 some laws. Start out in the book of Leviticus and start reading it through. It's filled full of law, 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 law. In fact, you can start with Exodus chapter 20 if you want and go over there to chapter 24 and read on through Exodus and you're going to find all kinds of laws. If you do this and if you, uh, you're not to lie about someone to be a false witness, I mean, it is filled full of them. 
all the way through. There's no person alive to keep all those laws. There's no person alive to ever memorize all the laws. You have to carry a book around all the time with you. You know, you have to look this up and look that up. Let's go on down. In verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now, when we get to this verse, I like to go to Romans chapter while we're here. We're in the book of Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. What about Abraham? They all know Abraham, don't they? Huh? Or Romans chapter 4, I'm sorry. Why, sure, Abraham, they know Abraham. But uh, what shall we say that Abraham our father is as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Are you going to heaven by good works of the flesh, or, or uh, are you not? So, let's, Paul says, I'm going to tell you about that. For if Abraham were justified by works, he had were of the glory, but not before God. How many people do you know that glory and how good they are? I, I don't know and many times that I've witnessed and the people that have told me very sincerely because they've been misled and they've been lied to. Well, look, look, I'm trying to do the best I can. And I really am. And I, I don't try to hurt people. I was raised to respect people and that. And they're proud of that. And in one respect, they should. But what they don't know is, you'll never do enough to go to heaven because you've already sinned, you see. So they are sincere, and they are trying to do it. And they're honest with what they tell, that I've had tell me. I didn't, never question their honesty. But they're proud of that. So, I come over here. If Abraham were justified by works, he have were of the glory, but not before God. Now, all the ones I've ever listened to, they did glory in the fact that they were trying to do the best they could. But don't glory before God, because God knows that you're a sinner. Because Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but we don't mention those. Okay. Let's go on down. Let's go here. What saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So if you're going to try to go to heaven by your good works and so forth, then God owes you eternal life. But that's not what the Bible says, because the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. It's a gift to God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So all that contradicts the Scriptures. And he shows Abraham wasn't justified by works. He was justified by faith. And then he goes on to verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, let's go back to Romans chapter 10. Okay? Now this is what Paul is giving to the Jews. His kin, his brethren, biologically, and so forth. Now, he goes on down, after describing the righteousness, which is of the law, and the man that doeth those things shall live by them, condemns them all, because no one ever lived by that. A hundred percent. But the righteousness, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Now, the righteousness, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise, and they're saying, I don't have to be looking for Christ to come and go to heaven and bring him down like you people say. Now, remember who he's talking to denies Jesus Christ. They hated Christ. They're still looking for Christ to come as the Jews over there are today. So he says, if you're righteous and you're saved, you're not saying, oh, we're looking for Christ to come. Maybe he's still up in heaven or maybe we can go down into the deep and bring him up from the dead. And there. Other words, when you're saved, you're not denying the Lord Jesus Christ that He died on the cross and He was buried and He rose again because you believe that and you are saved. So He's telling the Jews, but the righteous, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise. They don't say in their heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, but you do. And that's why He said that, because that's exactly what the Jews were doing. And he says, the righteous don't do that. The righteous don't have to say that. But you guys are, because you don't believe this is Christ who came from heaven, who going to the cross or went to the cross, and he's going to die, he's going to be buried, he's going to be resurrected again. You don't believe that at all. But the righteous do, 
So they say not what you guys are teaching. This isn't the Christ. We're still looking for him. Do you understand that verse now? I hope that you do. Do you see what it says? The righteous are not looking for Christ to come because they believe He already come. He was here upon the earth. He did miracle after miracle after miracle. You go to John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. Many other signs or miracles did Christ do which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus, humanity, is Christ, deity, and that believing you might have life through His name. Because if you don't believe that humanity and Jesus is Christ, deity, God in human flesh, you are not saved. Period. So it's a doctrinal statement including Jesus Christ was God in human flesh. If He wasn't God in human flesh, He would be a sinner. But He couldn't be a sinner because we find out that the seed and the sperm, one of them was eliminated. And that happened to be the sperm. And it was substituted with the Holy Spirit that has the power to create anything because God created the world and He created you as a human being. He created how you have reproduction. He knows every vein in your body. He knows every cell in your body which has hundreds and thousands of things within the little cell that we used to think was only made up of one component. It has hundreds of things in there now that they found. So... The righteous, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise, and they say not in their heart or their conscience, Who shall ascend? And he said that to the Jews that he's writing to, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, that they might be saved, that you guys might be saved. I bear you record you have a zeal to God, but not according to knowledge. You're ignorant of the real knowledge of God. You will not accept Jesus Christ. God sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him would never perish but have everlasting life. You do not believe that. John testified that to you. You absolutely reject that to today. And most of your Jews over in Palestine today are lost on their way to hell. There are some Christians, but it's a small percentage of the Jews. They're still looking, even the Orthodox Jews, still looking for Christ to come. <clears throat> okay, let's go on down. Or, who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. Again from the dead, because you don't believe when He was risen from the dead the first time, you reject it. So who's going to bring Him up again? And that's what you're looking for, you Jews that are lost. Oh, you're religious, my goodness, Christ. You have the Feast of Passover. Everybody comes to that. Hundreds and thousands come. You have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It continues another seven days. You have all of this. You bring your sacrifices. You bring them into Jerusalem. And we have Annas. And we have Caiaphas. And we have the high priest. That's, those are your high priests. One's a son-in-law. And he's got his hirelings in the temple because a lot of you have to come and buy a dove if you're poor. Or you've got to buy a lamb. And we got them all for you here at a pretty good price. So... When they come to be faithful to God, they got to pay the price that the priests charge, and they were making money head over heels. What a lucrative business those bunch of phony priests had by their hirelings that they put into the temple, just like you got in churches today. What do you think? Do you know the Catholics? When they want to pray you out of purgatory, may not ask you for a specific amount. Some do. Some don't. But they hint. And to give you a guilt trip that you need to be thankful for the prayers of this priest to pray your relatives out of a place that never existed. That doesn't exist today. This is the biggest money ripoff in organized religion ever devised by humanity is the Roman Catholic Church and the damnable priests that lie to the people, get money out of them to pray for some of their dead that are in purgatory to a place that never existed. You can't get any more. They ought to be charged with fraud, truthfully, because they're ripping you off. And first of all, if they had given them the gospel, they would never have to go to purgatory, which doesn't exist to begin with. But a manufactured place is a good way to get money for the church. 
My Bible says, when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, you will never perish but have eternal life, and you are absent from the body and present with the Lord. I don't see anything about passing through some place you guys made up in the Catholic organization. That's why I don't call it a church. I call it an organization that is corrupt with a religious front on it to suck you in, to get your money, your allegiance, and then send you to hell when it's all said and done. When I say that, I'm saying it honestly. I've lost count a long time ago. I'm just going to use a round figure. I think somewhere close to 300 or over priests I have talked to personally, and I've asked everyone that I've talked to, tell me how to go to heaven when I leave this earth. I've not found one Catholic priest that gave me the right answer that only faith in Jesus Christ, who died on that cross and paid for your sins, and promises you, you will never perish but have everlasting life. I have not had one. So don't tell me that I'm just picking on you or the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not worshiping a bunch of false priests that are not priests to begin with, because if to be a priest, under God's rule, you had to be a Jew. You had to be out of the tribe of Levi, and none of you priests are, and you are funnier than a $3 bill and shoved into the face of stupid humanity that will buy your lies and then send you right straight to hell. Period. We had a man call the other day. Well, in fact, it was yesterday. And he said, will you send me the CDs that you have? He said, I have the two sets on Martin Luther but I gave them away and they won't give them back. <laughs> he said, will you send me another set of those? And he wanted the set on the Roman Catholic Church. He said, I'm telling you, you don't find it today. We don't find preachers that are going to speak out and say, this is a lie that you're being taught. I don't know why they don't, but they don't. We can't, we can't find it anymore. Now that is not 100%. Now, Let's go on down, enough of that, let's go on down here, and we're going back to Romans chapter 10, okay? So, we don't say who's going to send into the deep in verse 7, because to bring Christ up again from the dead, because we know that he was resurrected 2,000 years ago. And, uh, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. What do you mean the word is nigh, even in your mouth? What word is nigh? The fact is, you can't disagree with something if you don't have the truth of something. It's nigh in your mouth, sir, that you are telling all the Jewish people, you scribes, you Pharisees, and, and, uh, and you high priest, and you leaders of this organization, of the whole Jewish religion, brother, my heart is there for Israel, all of Israel, the nation of Israel, that they might be saved. Okay? Now, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee. In other words, it's been told you. And, let's see what it says. Even in thy mouth. What was in your mouth when the word was given to you? Your mouth testified to the fact, I don't believe it. I'm still looking for Christ to come. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. I'm still looking for Him to come. But if you're saved, you're not looking up there for Christ to come. If you're saved, you're not going down to look for Him again. You're not looking for Him to be resurrected the second time. The saved have already trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. So, it's nigh in your mouth that you don't believe that. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that's the seat of your conscience, that is... The word of faith which we preach. It's in your heart and it's in your conscience that we preach because we preached it to you. But you don't believe it at all. And you say it with your mouth. You're testifying to the people, oh, don't believe this. Crucify Christ. He's a false imposter. He's a, he's a, he's a phony. He's a really the brother of this other man they crucified. And really, he is an imposter. It's not the real one they crucified. He come out with all these sort of things. And so forth. And then the disciples stole his body away. So, 
We have all these kind of things. This is what the Jews had taught, contrary to what Paul was teaching and what the true Christians were teaching, and so forth. Then, after this, I want to read verse 8 again, because this gets us to verse 9 of what Paul's telling the nation of Israel. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. It's in thy mouth that you deny the teaching that Paul has given, and you deny that Jesus Christ is the Savior. You deny that He is the Son of God. You, you deny that He is going to be resurrected, and so forth. And in your heart, your conscience, that is the word of faith which we preach. You've denied the word of God which we preach. But you've heard it. It's in your conscience and convicted your conscience, and that's why you hate us as Christians. You can apply the same thing today. Now, with that in mind, and very interesting, I think I have a few minutes here that I can give you some scriptures here just to show you this, and I think it would be very, very interesting. They heard the truth which convicted their conscience. They mocked and confessed their hatred of Christ to others and were lost. So then Paul comes down, but I want to show you, first of all, go with me, if you will, to the Gospel of John, all right? To the Gospel of John. If we go to John here in chapter 18, John chapter 18, okay? We get over here to John chapter 18, and look in verses 12 to 13. Then the band and the captain officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest of that year. Well, they arrested Christ, the band, and the captain, and officers of the Jews. These was those that were in charge and put under there, under Annas and Caiaphas, who hated him. Because he drove the money changers out when he first started his ministry. In John chapter 2, verses 13 to 16, he went in and drove the money changers out. Second time he drove them out was uh, getting later on in the ministry in Matthew chapter 21 and verses 10 to 13. That's the second time he drove them out. And then the third time that he drove them out was in Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 17. And in essence... He said to them, My house shall be called the house of prayer. That was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 56 in verse 7. And he added to this, But now, after that prophecy, you have made it a den of thieves. In other words, you big bunch of screwballs. You're dishonest. You overcharge for the people that come on these various feasts into Jerusalem. You're as crooked as a snake. That's what you are. So Paul said with all of this, and I will show you one more place without just taking up your time. Matthew chapter 23, probably did Christ uprule these people, these scribes and these Pharisees, and you're telling me that we should be as meek as Jesus? Okay, well let's see how meek Jesus was, alright? I'm sure he was, and when he got through he probably apologized to these poor people that he had upset so much. Now, I'm just joking with you. Don't believe the word I'm saying. Okay. Matthew chapter 23. Okay. We're going to find out here. And Jesus, in verse 1, And then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. We come on down. Verse 5. All their works they do to be seen of men. They even make their robes, make broad their phylacteries, and uh, enlarge the borders of their garments. Oh, don't they put that on their white collars and so forth like that? And if we're going to apply this to an organization today, we want you to know how much we just love God, and we want to separate and be different. The Pharisees were known as separatists. Well, you have groups today, their own Catholic Church is a separatist. And we're going to show you by the way we dress. We'll wear our low, long gowns and our white collars. So we're separate from any other because we are the one world church now. We're it. You know, we are the church. 
Yeah, you are. Phone here in the three dollar bill. You're the false church. All right. Now look here, and then I'm just going through this real fast. Sometime you got to read it for yourself. This is what Christ said. All right. He said, first of all, in verse 8, Be not called rabbi, for one is your master. Even, rabbi is the, is the Greek, by, therefore, master. And all of you are brethren. Okay. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. If they believe the Bible at all, our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And there. They don't even believe that. Amazing. Look on down, if you will. Okay, in verse 13, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, and you hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, in other words, you're lost on your way to hell, neither suffer them that are entering to go in. They want to enter, but you're giving them a false way. Follow your religious system, you scribes and Pharisees. Look on down. Verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites! You make a pretense of a long prayer. Verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you can compass or compass sea, uh, sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him a twofold child of hell than yourselves. You're already going to hell, but now you're a twofold child of hell because, first of all, they were going to hell to begin with, but you didn't give them the gospel to be saved from that hell. You give them another religion that makes them a twofold child of hell. So you sealed them with a religion that you got that you're already going to hell, so you might say they got two strikes against them. Number one, they were born a sinner. You could have told them how to go to heaven, but you didn't. So they were already lost on their way to hell. Second is, now you give them a religion, that's not going to take them to heaven either. So they're a twofold child of hell. And thanks to you, you lying suckers, that give them a false religion. You could have told them how to go to heaven, but you didn't. Now, Christ is pretty mild and meek, isn't he? And we hear this thing, follow Christ. No, 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 no. You, don't, you, you, you people that say that, you want to be just nice and meek and sugar wouldn't melt in your mouth and all that kind of stuff. No, stand up and tell them, very truthfully. In fact, I'll tell you something. The one person that we were talking about was the agnostic. Remember me telling you about that, that did some work for us of Marshall? Total agnostic. Listen, 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 and so forth. Come right out and said, with your philosophy, you're going to spend eternity in hell. You, you've picked peace here and a peace there, and he thought Allah is, uh, he's convinced Allah is the same as our God here. And I said, well, you study, but I'll tell you what, you pay attention to what you read, and so forth. So, when I went back up to him, I took uh, the evolution book. Uh, well, I gave him a chance, probably won't take it, it not make any difference. So, anyway, I got up there, I said, here's the book we've written here. I said, now, uh, uh, I think after you give me all this garbage you gave me, maybe you'd like a little bit of truth. I said, this book's went out all over the world. And he said, well, let me look at it. So he's going through it, and he's looking at it. And I said, well, it costs you eight bucks, because that's what it costs to sprint. So anyway, he said, I want to read that book. <clears throat> I said, good. Where's your eight bucks? He said, I don't have it. And I said, well, the book's still there, you know. So he pulled out and said, I got ten. Keep the change. Put that in the offering. So he gave me ten dollars. So anyway, you'll find that in the offering in there for that. There. I marked it on the front there because it's ten with some other things. That, uh, books. But anyway, so much for that. Okay, let's go back now. With that in mind, just that little bit, you can go all through Matthew 23. You scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You want to be like Christ? Huh. Well, I, maybe you wouldn't say that. We come back here now and with that Paul says, now I want to tell you something. You've confessed that you deny Christ. He is a, he is a phony and everything else. Now that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now if you will do this then you can be saved. You will be saved. But you haven't done that. You confessed with your mouth because it's in your conscience that you don't believe the record God gave of His Son. You don't even believe the Old Testament prophets. You do not believe. You're looking for Him here. Don't say, the Christian doesn't say ascend into heaven and maybe we'll find Christ. We'll send down below. Maybe we'll bring Him up from the dead. And, and maybe, uh, you know, He'll be resurrected again. Christians don't have to say that because they know it already happened. But you do. You say, He didn't really die yet. He's not really God in human flesh. And then Paul says, this is what you have to do to be saved. 
This is your mind. Now, you've confessed you hate Christ. Now, to be saved, you've got to confess that you believe He is God in human flesh. That if thou shalt confess, if thou, you Jewish people that I'm talking to, brother, my heart's desire, desire to God for Israel that they might be saved. He goes all down through here and lists at how they're doing. Then if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Kyrios. That means God. Lord, when they translated the Septuagint, that is when they translated the Greek from the Hebrew. Then, when they, every time they come to Jehovah, J-H-V-H, the vows of supply, J-E-V-A-H, uh, A-H, they needed a word in the Greek that was equivalent or represented or said that Jesus was God. So they used Kyrios. Kyrios. So in other words, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Jesus as God, see they didn't believe he was God, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. See, they didn't believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead because they were looking for Jesus to come. Paul says the Christian isn't looking for him in heaven. He's not going down here. He's not going to seem uh, to be raised from the dead the second time. But if you will believe, right, throw that garbage in the can, and if, that if thou shalt confess, it's your choice. If you do this, if you make the decision to repent, biblically, metanoia, change your mind, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is God, that, and believe in your heart, not only that He's God, but believe in your heart, your conscience, that God has raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In other words, you guys are lost. If you want to be saved, you've got to believe that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. Instead of confessing that you deny Him, then confess that you believe He is the Messiah as your Messiah. Now I'm going to stop right there because this has nothing to do with bringing and cutting this verse out of the Bible. Bringing it into a church has nothing to do with the church. It is strictly directed toward He's speaking to the Jews. They denied Christ. And if you'll change your mind, you don't have to be looking for Him or searching for Him or anything else. He's already here. So if you will believe that He's already here, that He died upon the cross, He was resurrected, and He is God in human flesh, He had to be or He would be a sinner, then you will be saved. But that's what you've got to change your mind about. Because you are all screwed up with these false teachers and your rabbis and your priests and your scribes that deny Christ. So you've got to repent, change your mind, metanoia, and believe the testimony that Christ is giving you that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Because the king is at hand, personally, personified as God in human flesh. This verse has nothing to do with the church coming forward, preachers isolating it and cutting with a pair of scissors out and saying, this is what you need to do to be saved. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. And I think our time's going. It is. Okay. Well, let me just close here if we will. But I think it's time that we get an exposition on what the Bible teaches about a tradition that, that Baptists have pulled out put into churches, and if I don't want to come forward, I can sit back there and go right straight to hell. No, no, no. This verse is so chopped up by Baptists and many, many others, including your Pentecostals and many, many others, that it would be a person set back there, and I would have been one of them. Don't ask me to come forward when you can tell me how to be saved in my seat. What in the world are you playing games with me for? I can give you some illustrations later. When we have time. Bill full sin, I'm a sinner. If you're watching, you have never trusted Jesus Christ. We've all sinned. God says, I'm not willing you should perish. Please don't go to hell and pay for your sin. I did it 2,000 years ago, and this hand represents Christ. 
So your sins are all paid for. It just amounts to the very simple thing. Do you believe it? And God said, I gave my only begotten Son. He died on the cross. He paid for your sin. And He said, it's finished. Tell us the I. This is it. It's all done. Nothing you can do to add to it because you've got to be born from above. That's why Christ came from above to earth because there's nothing you can do humanistically down here to ever merit eternal life. And if you could, you'd only brag about it. And you have whereof to glory, but not before God because He knows that you're a sinner and He loved you and He paid for your sin. The minute you'll believe it, God said, I love the world, gave my only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in Him. I very simply believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross because He loved me. He paid for my sin. He wanted me to live in heaven with Him. And He had to do that for me or I would have to go to hell and pay for my own. And how stupid that would be, pay for my own sin when it's already paid for. The home is bought and paid for. Offers to you as a gift. I don't have to say, Jesus, I'm going to let Jesus come into my heart. What does that have to do with salvation? You're going to let Jesus come into your heart to do what? Where's the verse at? It's not there. With the heart man, and the heart is the seed of your conscience, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You don't ask Jesus to do anything. Oh, save me, dear Lord. But He's asking you. He's telling you it's done. It's finished. It's completely paid for. Hey, quit asking me to do something. Save me. Why do you ask me to save me? I'm telling you, I, if you believe that I died for you, was buried and rose again, and I paid for your sins, all you got to do is believe it. Accept it. Believe it. Don't ask me to keep doing something. Believe it. And you'll never perish but have eternal life. We get in churches. And we get all of these other things added to it. If you've never trusted Christ, the minute if you'll believe He died on that cross for you and paid for your sins, your sins are put to His account 2,000 years ago and are completely paid. He takes His righteousness and He gives you what you could never earn yourself <coughs> down here. He looks at you and looks at the righteousness of Jesus Christ and you're standing right there with His righteousness that He gave you and looks at you as absolutely perfect because you have His righteousness now and your sins are completely paid for. I hope if you've never trusted Christ, you'll do it. You could do it in church this morning. You could do watching the CDs, whatever. And thank the Lord that He loved you so much that He paid for your sins so you don't have to do it in hell yourself. I hope you'll do that. Let's just bow one word of prayer. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I thank you, dear Lord, for each one here. Thank you for those who are going to watch the CDs and so forth, that it will be an inspiration to trust Jesus Christ and Him alone. We've got churches all over this country in the United States of America. And I'll tell you what, some of them are the biggest and phoniest I've ever seen in my life. They would have sent me to hell, they'll send anybody to hell. It is faith in Jesus Christ who paid for our sin plus nothing. Bless each one here and those that are watching. And we'll just give you all the glory and thank you for loving me, dying for my sins. In Jesus' precious name, amen.